and good morning everyone. Um, last week of the class, uh, we got some things going on this week. I, I hope that the weekend update email has like laid everything out and made everything super clear in terms of what's happening. Um, I just want to kind of give you a little run rundown of it really quickly, but if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat and we'll, we'll try to address them. Um, one one small little note, uh, I, and I promise I'm not going to get on a big soapbox about this or anything, but I did, um, there was something that was kind of, uh, I guess, sad to me, and probably anyone who's in chat here, this doesn't apply to you, but um, some little disappointment I had. I, I was looking at the Google Analytics, or on the YouTube Analytics for my videos, and it said that um, my average viewing length is something like, four and a half seven and a half minutes something like that for these videos and uh that kind of just made me a little sad <laughs> it's like probably i think maybe we had some similar issues as before in terms of um people just watching for the code and then putting in the code and not necessarily watching the videos and there's not a ton to do about that right now but it might still be relevant for me to mention just in the in the sense that um you know the the videos we've been having i think are pretty important and useful for understanding everything um, and being like prepared for exams and stuff like that. So uh, given that you've got makeup exam opportunities for exam one and two, uh, all of this through this week, th those are open until Friday at midnight, um, it might be useful to kind of go back through those lectures. I think just reading the textbook and looking over some homework problems or looking at my lecture notes is kind of not going to be adequate all by itself for you to really gain mastery of the material. Um, but so the lectures are one way for you to get some more help in, in learning this stuff. And, and um, but I, I'm also want to make myself available this week to talk with you as well. Um, is this for the YouTube videos of these classes? Yes. Yeah, that is. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's always the concern moving it online. I, and I'm not going to ever do something. I would never have done something more draconian about this anyway, but just kind of a little thing I saw <laughs> and wanted to say, so, you know, just acknowledge as a reality of what's happened here. Um, Definitely, if you're going to be taking classes next quarter, I'd encourage you to not do that for whatever classes you're taking, whether that's with me or with somebody else. Um, don't shortchange yourself. Um, I, it, it kind of the I was saying this to my last class too. Um, I mean, the motivation that makes me want to say something about it just has to do with um, wanting you to get the most out of the opportunity of school, just learning the most. That's the thing I really care about. Uh, grades can go to hell. I don't really care about that. Um, Danny says, I've been watching portions of them after the live for review. Maybe others are too, and that's affecting the numbers I'm seeing. It's That's possible. I thought of that. Um, I still would have expected uh, the averages to kind of work out a little differently. And looking at the number of views and how many people are, say, here live versus who need to watch it on, on their own later on YouTube, uh, I maybe there's a little bit of that. But this isn't about me playing some kind of blame game or something like that. It's just uh, something I saw and wanted to lift up. I mean, ultimately, it's it's all about you and your own relationship with this. I, I, I'm not, I don't get judgmental about it. Um, I just want to be supportive as much as possible. That's, I, I can only make the opportunities available and you do it with them what you will. And I, I'm not like privately judging anything about this. Um, yeah, just want to be encouraging. Um, okay, so let, let's take stock of the week. Um, so uh, you you have exam two is now complete. Um, today I will be uh, kind of working my tail off to get uh, all of the exams graded as fast as possible. I did a few of them last night after midnight, um, and I'm going to be after I get done teaching today. I'm going to get right on that and try knocking them out as fast as possible. I'll be sending you an email with another YouTube link where I have a video where I go through all the problems in exam two, just like I did for the first exam. Um, so you'll have that to work with um, in kind of diagnosing your attempt with exam two, um, in case, especially in case of you're thinking about doing uh, a makeup for exam two as well. So uh, Jaden, I saw you were typing something in there. Did you have something you wanted to ask?
will we be reviewing NCT and SCT again? Um, I'm not going to be doing that. I'm not going to be doing any more review in our sort of video lecture times this week. Um, I'm devoting this time for getting at least a little bit of commentary in about the informal fallacies. More on that in a second. Um, but we could absolutely talk about it um, outside of outside of class if you want to. Um, I'm trying to make myself as available as possible this week uh, for doing review. Um, maybe you saw from the weekend update email that Tuesday, tomorrow, is supposed to be Student Success Day. If we were on campus, I would be on campus and available for drop-in meetings whenever. Um, my plan is to get on this uh, Skype thing tomorrow just like I normally would and make myself available for, for drop-in conversations kind of uh, all morning long. Same kind of period in which I'd be teaching, 9.30 to 1.30. I'm going to be uh, here and available. Um, and uh, so that's an opportunity. You can also reach out and we can have a phone call um, at other times as well. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I'll be grading exam two. hopefully have it done by late tonight as fast as I can get them done. Um, and then I'm, I'll be sending out after I get done teaching here in the afternoon, I'll be sending out this email with a link to a YouTube video about the answers to exam two. Um, and then you've got the entire rest of the week through midnight on Friday to take uh, makeup exam one and makeup exam two, which again, the way this is going to work is they are modularly designed. So they'll look exactly like the original exams. But if you want to take the makeup exam, you don't have to do all of them. You can choose sort of section by section which ones you want to do, and that's how I'll be grading them. So let's say you wanted to redo the linguistic analysis section from exam one. You take makeup exam one, and maybe you don't put answers down for anything else, but you just do the problems in the linguistic analysis section. I will grade those on the makeup exam, and then compare your score for that section against your score for that section on the original exam and see if it's higher. And if it's higher, you can't lose points here, but if it's higher, I will basically add those extra points to your score uh, on the original exam. So what you'll see in Canvas is a partial credit, uh, just the grade, a graded version of the makeup exam, just like you would have seen on the original exam, but I will basically nullify all the credit on the makeup exam assignment and then I'll go back to the original exam and modify that assignment. So your score, you'll see a change in your score potentially on the original exam um, instead of on the makeup. So it's not just like extra credit. It's really a redo, uh, like literal redo, um, where you can like replace your scores without any penalties. There's no, I, I don't care about at what point in the quarter you learn this stuff. As long as you leave the quarter with some mastery, then then that's what I'm happy to give you credit for in terms of your, your grade. So that's how that's going to work. Um, I do need the makeup exams by Friday or I cannot guarantee I'll have everything graded in time for final grades. So there, there's that. Um, and uh, contact me at any point during the week uh, if you want to do some review or talk over any of the material or problems or anything like that. Um, so that's that's the really core stuff in terms of completing the class and stuff that's related to grades. Um, but like I said, the rest of this week, which is today and our finals period on Friday, um, I will be uh, I will be um, trying to talk about informal fallacies as much as possible. In the original design of this class, the informal fallacies was like the last little couple weeks of the quarter and we were going to have a little extra exam it wasn't going to be like the other two exams uh, it was just going to be like a little matching thing we're not doing any of that officially that's sort of been scrapped because of the way schedules worked and and just all the madness I was like well, I'll make it easier on you um, in terms of managing all this stuff at the end of the term so we're not going to try to push it but I did want you to have some access to the curriculum like I said in the weekend update email that's the main thing that I would want for you and so you got in the weekend update email a kind of collection of all of the curriculum that we would have covered if we had had the time for it um, and and like I said there uh, in in the weekend update email 
Um, I don't expect that you're going to cover all of that material in this last week or do it on your own or something with all the other stuff that you're trying to finish up the term, both for our class and for other classes too. Um, with everything, I, you know, that's not the expectation that I have. Um, but I wanted to make it available to you in case maybe after the quarter is over, you want to take a look at it. So what I'm going to do with our sessions this week is just kind of open up that territory, give you kind of the introduction to what that curriculum is all about. We'll, we'll probably do a lot of introduction stuff today. And then maybe on the Friday session, we'll just try to talk about as many of the fallacies as, as we can uh, so you can get some exposure to, to those ideas. Um, it's really cool stuff. I, I'm, I'm very sad that we were not able to do it in a more robust way because I definitely think that this informal fallacies unit is one of the parts of the class design that is most immediately applicable and practically useful to you in your everyday life. Like it's it's not hard to take a study of that curriculum and integrate it in some purposeful and productive way almost immediately. Like kind of plug and play. Boom. You It, it gives you some more empowerment, both as someone who is going to be an audience for receiving arguments and how to think critically about the arguments you're being given from others, but also in helping you be a better arguer yourself, how to be a more responsible person in terms of how you're you're trying to defend your positions or convince other people and all that good stuff. So uh, we'll we'll do a little little introduction, just a little tip of the iceberg uh, this week on on that material, and that that's what I'm planning on getting started with here. But um, like I said, uh, no expectations for you to be really seriously engaging with it. I just want you to come to the lectures. Um, they they are going to be graded. Uh, there was some confusion about when I was talking about them being mandatory. Um, I'm only indicating that these are not optional for attendance purposes. Like they, They're going to be graded like regular attendance. It's not to suggest in any way that you need to be on campus. That's that's not happening. We're not, we're not doing anything like that. So, um, so yeah, any, any questions about all that? Um, anything I can help to clarify? Everything pretty clear? How are we doing? Not, not seeing anything in the chat. <laughs> Hello. You're good? Okay. Do you know how the grading works? Does exam three give us 100% or 10% of the grade? So exam three is just not happening. It's being removed. Um, so what that means is that the 10% that the third exam would have been worth in your final grade is basically cut up and diffused between all the other sections. So it's not as though I'm splitting up, uh, or the way that the math works out is that 10% just gets added to exams 1 and 2. It actually gets diffused between your attendance and your homework. Every, everything else is just weighted a little bit more heavily, but in the same sort of proportions. Does that make sense, Nikolai? Yep, okay. Okay. It means the math kind of works out. It's a little harder to ballpark it just with what's there on Canvas, but um, you, you you can basically count that there there isn't anything that's gonna be contributed from exam three. The way the way Canvas deals with things is that anything that is ungraded does not count as zero, it just is like just disappears. <laughs> it is not factored in to how the averages are calculated or anything like that. It'll it'll automatically get diffused. That those that ten percent credit will get diffused to all the other sections proportionately. Any other questions for how things are working this last week?
looks like a no, potentially. I hope I hope that's true. I hope I I've been a, an effective communicator, and you know all the expectations, and there's nothing confusing or or weird um, that you you know exactly what what's going on here. I really hope that's the case. I try <laughs> to make sure that that's what happens. Um, one thing I do want to uh, just really double down on and, and absolutely emphasize here is that, especially with regard to like this informal fallacies material that we're we're only going to be able to touch on, but which you're given much, you, you know, I'm giving you all the materials so you can take a look at. Um, you, I, I really do hope. It's my distinct hope that after the quarter is over, you don't think of. Uh, me as no longer a resource or some option that you can go to that you you mm -hmm. always are free to contact me um whether it's about the informal fallacies or anything else um i i my attitude about my relationship with my students is that you're not just with me for one quarter i mean we have a quarter together in the class that we're taking together and during that quarter we're, we're working together a lot and and i'm definitely a, a principal resource and a source of of support for you um, but after the quarter is over it's not like I wash my hands of you and I'm over and, and it's done you know um, you've got my contact information and you are always free to use it uh, for whatever purpose I, I get contacted by old students all the time sometimes I just want to talk about something and I'm very open to that. that that's not something I resent or consider you bugging me or something like that um, I really think of my job as as a, as much as possible as a as a human thing you know like we're working together on something it's not just about the school system and the navigating the mechanics of it and grades and all that kind of thing like i i don't see my my professional job as limited to that kind of role um so especially if you want to do more philosophy or, or talk about stuff or get help with some other philosophy class that maybe you're taking with some entirely different instructor or just shoot the shit and just talk about some stuff. Um, I, I've enjoyed working with all of you this quarter and uh, would definitely welcome any kind of uh, future interaction too. If there's some way in which I can be a benefit to your studies as a student or as just a critical reasoner, a thinker, a philosopher, um, you're, you're always welcome to contact me. That, that invitation is always extended and my door is is always open to you so but especially if you want to do that with the informal fallacies you know and get some assistance with that I'm I'm here um, in the in the uh, weekend update email when I was giving you all of those uh, um, uh, materials and stuff for the informal fallacies I also gave you a bunch of YouTube videos from when I taught the class online that covers the informal fallacies and you watch those and you've got questions about them by all means you know look me up and and we can talk more about it. Okay, anything else before I get into some stuff with the fallacies? Okay, I think the answer to that is no. If anything comes up, drop it in the chat. I'll, I'm happy to address it. We can always go back uh, on that. But let's let's talk about the fallacies. So. What are these things? I, I've described them a few other times in the class, like toward the beginning of the quarter, of like you know laying out what the original class design was supposed to be all about. The informal fallacies are basically just a grab bag mix of certain kinds of argumentative styles, maybe particular forms of argument or argumentative behaviors that are either so problematic or nasty like abusive or pernicious like uh, pernicious biases that are very hard to root out or to be aware of or sort of just mistakes in general that are really common um, that, that they're either so nasty pernicious common whatever that we want to uh, basically identify the pattern the problematic pattern of reasoning or argumentative behavior label it so we can name it so we can track it, both in terms of, like I was saying earlier, being uh, someone who's listening to arguments to be able to detect when uh, those arguments are doing something problematic, um, or to be on guard against using them yourself. 
And that's actually what I think is maybe the most important or valuable part of, of learning the curriculum. It's just kind of having a bunch of things on your radar of like, I don't want to argue this way. There's a little anecdote I, I sometimes like to, to share in this regard that um, I might have even shared before in the class. I can't remember exactly, so stop me if you've heard this one before. But when I first started teaching, uh, I, w I was teaching like intro classes and, and getting you know, student papers where they're, you know, it's philosophy, so you're going to be making arguments. And I was getting really depressed <laughs> because I was like, these arguments are so bad. And they are, uh, you know, a lot of what my students were turning in were arguments that are totally guilty of all of these fallacies. And, um, and not just the like sort of ones that are natural or more sympathetic, but but also the ones that are like really abusive or insincere, you know, these sorts of things. And so I was like, what is going on? Like, is the state of our society this bad or something? And then um, I was like, oh, my students are so insincere in terms of being truth seekers, right? They're just arguing and using these kind of bullshit tactics for being persuasive without actually doing sincere truth seeking mm -hmm. sort of arguments, right? Being a cooperative truth seeker. And then I got over this pretty fast um, because as I started to get to know my students, I and not just like receiving their written work, but talking with them about it and what are they thinking. Um, and this has been the pattern all the way through my 10 years of teaching now um, that I, I, I started to realize or I became aware of how my students are not insincere people. They're not all trolls or something like that, but that they my best hypothesis here is that what explains the, the how common these fallacious forms of reasoning were is just that students were uh, having them modeled to them by other people in society generally um, that when they sort of saw someone arguing and they were persuasive and effective um, they're like I'm gonna just do what they do just kind of monkey see monkey do kind of thing like follow here's an example I was like wow that person really argued well and then I try to mimic their same style and so these sort of problematic uh, argumentative patterns get perpetuated right they get spread around um, and and reinforced and the you know there there's a lot of reasons why these fallacies are things that people do even if they don't make sense or even if they don't contribute very much to sincere truth seeking usually a lot of them are effective at persuasion just not the kind of persuasion we're looking for you know the point of arguing is not to convince the other person that you're right or to the, to convince them to hold the belief but that it really has been demonstrated to be the most rationally defensible position that's what we're really looking for so a sincere arguer doesn't want to be persuasive if their arguments are not actually legitimate if they don't actually present the grounds for rational justification for their position. And this is what I, I try to do even when, when I'm just having arguments with people sort of informally, um, sort of indicate that I don't want you to agree with me unless my arguments actually are effective. Um, that's, that's the main goal. So if they aren't, if I don't actually have the most rationally defensible position, I hope that my defense of my position actually presents the opportunity for me to be refuted that I'd want you to disagree with me if I don't have the best position here. Um, that That's definitely the line, one of the lines between sort of sincere argumentative behavior and insincere argumentative behavior. Uh, and that sincerity translates into a whole host of other types of issues. If you're, if you're operating in a debate more like a competitive exercise, like a rap battle or kind of intellectual wrestling match or something like that, then there's going to be tactics that you're going to use as a part of your argumentative efforts that are going to be rationally problematic. Um, there's a greater danger of that. Um, so having these fallacies is, I think, primarily a matter of just being responsible um, about your own behavior. But it is also for being able to detect bullshit in what other people are throwing at you too. Maybe to not find some of these other, uh, ex maybe you know, watching YouTube videos or something, or public debate, to not be hoodwinked into thinking this is actually effective argumentation. Be able to recognize that there's problems with it. That that's also part of the function of of tracking all of these 
mistakes. Now, when it comes to fallacies themselves, there isn't, like I said, it's kind of a grab bag of a lot of different things. And that's actually why I like using the text that I have selected for, for this material um, from the Attacking Faulty Reasoning book, which is where we got the Code of Intellectual Conduct from. The author, Edward Damer, wrote this book that's basically like an encyclopedia of fallacies. And I, I sent you a PDF of the selections. Uh, there's a bunch, just dozens of fallacies. And, and even if we had full time for this, I would, wasn't going to do all of them from the book. We're, I had 32 of them that I picked out. And sometimes when we're on constrained schedules, when I teach this class, I do even less, like maybe 24 of them or something. But uh, that's been the kind of common abbreviated set. But there's a lot out there. And attacking faulty reasoning is kind of like an encyclopedia mm -hmm. of these. So they're all over the place. And one thing I like about the attacking faulty reasoning presentation of them is that Edward Damer organizes the fallacies in terms of which principles from the code of intellectual conduct that they violate. And some of his categorization schemas I, you know, take some issue with. I, I disagree on some of them. And, and definitely some of them um, uh, apply more so to, uh, or they might apply to multiple um, violations of principles from the code, not just one of them, or things like that. There's some room for, but I, I like the general framework here that Edward's doing, that this isn't just about these don't do this, don't do this, this is bad, this is bad. But to understand why it's bad is because it's going really against something that is good or that we ought to be doing, something that would be intellectual virtue. Like what what a idealistic argumentative behavior would look like using this argumentative strategy, pattern, or behavior um, or type of argument goes against that. And that's that's how we can understand them, is, is not just what is bad about them, but the badness is about not doing something good. And I really like this. Uh, there's, um, there's a lot of ways in which I've seen the curriculum around the informal fallacies taught in a way that I kind of have issue with. Um, but actually, before I get into this next little bit, I just want to check in. How are things going in the chat? Does anyone have any questions so far? Questions or comments? Doing good? Okay, okay. Did I tell that story before? Was I was I rehashing an old story <laughs> with my students when I started teaching? Have you already heard that one? Okay, good, good, good. Okay. All right, looks like we're good. Don't be shy about jumping in. Thank you. Thank you, David and Nathan, for responding. <laughs> okay, so here, here's my next sort of idea. A lot of times, the fallacies get presented as kind of like fouls in sports. You know, sports, there's rules for how the game is supposed to be played, and when someone violates one of those rules, blow the whistle on them, like there's a penalty, something like that. And sometimes the fallacies get treated this way too. In fact, there was a funny sort of meme meme, -y, meme -y sort of thing that happened, I think it was back in the like mid-80s even. Um, it was getting passed around at the uh, American Philosophical Association has these regional conferences, big conferences, most important conferences in the field every year in America. They're actually, they're, they're so important that they're divided into three sections. There's the Pacific, there's the Central, and then there's the East Coast uh, uh, regional conferences that happen for philosophy. And sometimes there's little fun things that get passed around. And there was, um, there was uh, this, some of my professors mm -hmm. had it when I, when I was a student. It's this uh, bike page that has a bunch of uh, the different signals of NFL referees, like doing different gestures and stuff, like um, the, the different hand gestures for certain penalty or rule violations that occur. And then they had the informal fallacies like listed underneath them. It's like uh, using the metaphor of, of sports penalties as a way to uh, 
capture the idea of good argumentative and bad argumentative practices in philosophy. And it's cute and fun, and I'm sure you've seen, or it's very possible that you've seen the modern version of this joke through image macros of like actual photos of NFL referees doing different things, and then it's got text for for like the informal fallacy that's being violated. Maybe some of you have seen this on the internet. Um, but I actually, it's a funny joke, and it's kind of innocent, it's fine that way, but I actually think that this is the wrong way to think about the fallacies. Um, it's not as though if you're in a debate with someone and you catch them in a fallacy, you can like blow the whistle on them and be like, all right, get out of here with that argument, this kind of thing. There's actually something called the fallacy fallacy, which is when the only way that someone is uh, responding critically to someone else's ideas is to try to leverage accusations of fallacy violations toward them, which indicates that there, there's something deeper going on here and that this isn't just a matter of playing by the rules and that if you don't play by the rules you're doing you're like not a legitimate part of the conversation it's not it's not like kind of a you must be this tall to ride this ride kind of thing as I've said before I, I think that approach to thinking about the standards of proper intellectual behavior is you know sort of it's on to something. It's capturing something that's legitimate, but it also has got some baggage to it that is problematic. Um, we're never going to be able to be perfect about these things, and there can still be some good ideas present in an argument that has been framed poorly or that has been argued for in fallacious ways. This isn't to say that the fallacies aren't problems, but it's a matter of like what our relationship is with those problems. I've mentioned before I'm an ethicist. And that I definitely bring kind of moral philosophy as a lens to thinking about teaching a class like informal logic, just about logical issues, um, to see it through the lens of ethics. And the same dynamic happens in ethics too, where we're trying to figure out what's right and wrong and good and bad. But when we have some standards, like say some moral principles in a theory that we agree to, um, what's our attitude or relationship to what happens when these things are violated? Um, we want to, on the one hand, acknowledge that there's something bad occurring if someone's acting badly. But at the same time, what do we do to recover it? Do you just toss everyone out on their ear as soon as they make some kind of moral mistake? Um, do you use it as a, a, a weapon against other people or against yourself? Like a way in which you can be sort of self-flagellating about your moral guilt about things? I mean, this seems there's some ways in which our attitude or our relationship with moral principles and values can undermine what they're actually able to contribute and how they can be useful and helpful. Um, and I see the same thing happening here with these fallacies. They're supposed to be useful guidelines for helping us have as idealistic uh, a argumentative activity as, as possible. But they, the, our sensitivity to them or how we may try to enforce them might sort of destroy or kill the opportunity, the positive opportunities of what we can do in a debate. This is another reason why I really appreciated uh, how Edward Damer approaches presenting the informal fallacies in his book. So I, I mentioned the book is kind of like these encyclopedia entries. So you get a, you know, the name of the fallacy, you get a definition of it, a description of what the fallacy is sort of in principle, theoretically. And you get a bunch of examples and then there's some commentary about it. But at the end of every one of these entries describing one of the fallacies, Edward Damer puts in a little section called Attacking the Fallacy. And this is some advice from him about what to do if your opponent uses this fallacy against you in a debate. Some of my opinions about how to respond to that situation are different than what Edward offers as advice. So he and I kind of disagree in some places about how to deal with it, but I really appreciated the fact that he's at least trying, you know, that there's some kind of acknowledgement of this. Um, in my lecture notes, uh, lecture six and seven are the, the two lecture notes that are uh, for this informal fallacies unit. Um, I also offer some, I call them Tim's suggestions or something at the, at the end of some of these entries about what to do about these things, and, and I'll talk about some of them with the fallacies that we get the time to present this week, um, so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. But um, whether it's advice coming from me or from 
from Edward Damer. Um, in either event, it's like someone using a fallacy in a debate threatens the productivity of that debate encounter, which is an interpersonal activity. It's, it's a relational thing that we do with each other. And the use of those fallacies undermines what our, our sort of goals are in something like cooperative truth-seeking. Remember back to the Code of Intellectual Conduct. There were two standards for the code itself of like, what, why are we doing this? What are we hoping for? What are our objectives? One was that we want the debate to give us the best chance of getting at the truth or as near as we can get to it. Maybe, maybe figuring out the most rationally defensible position or at the very least finding the best way for us to adjudicate the, the fact of our disagreement. So there's that project, the truth-seeking part. But there's also the part about um, treating each other and ourselves ethically. Um, that we constrain our behavior in context of disagreement in light of what we owe to others and to ourselves. So there's both of those components. And the fallacies, in as much as they go against the intellectual virtues on the code of intellectual conduct that promote those two goals, they undermine those goals, those purposes, those projects. So thinking about how if someone is engaging in some behavior which is counterproductive to those two goals, how can you recover this? Rather than just saying, nah, this debate is fucked, like, blow it up, or get out of here. You're not allowed in this conversation anymore because you're not on good behavior or something like this. Um, how can we recover uh, the good or the p potential for good in this conversation in the face of people doing things problematically? And again, an analogy with eth ethics is not inappropriate here. So think about um, just any ethical theory or project or program whatsoever, whether you've studied ethics as a subject of philosophy or, or you just think about ethics generally anyway, or maybe you get an ethics out of a religious tradition that you're a part of or something like that, just any ethical position. An ethical perspective is going to be making prescriptions about what is proper behavior and what's inappropriate behavior. But it's also going to need to have some guidelines about what to do when people don't follow those rules. So when people don't act morally, when there's a violation of those principles, how do you respond to that wrongdoing? That's also going to be a question of ethics. What's the ethical response to unethical action? The whole space of questions about punishment and moral responsibility are the part of an ethical theory that address that question. And it's, as an ethicist myself, this has been an area of uh, some research on my part. I, I've tried to create some theories to help with these questions, uh, or how to address some of the, the, the particular controversies that can happen in figuring out what is the ethical response to ethical wrongdoing. Um, the same thing happens here in the context of of ideal argu argumentative behavior. When, there's, when things have gone wrong, if they're off the rails or threatening to go off the rails, how can we get things back on the, on the rails? How can we recover the opportunity of this debate to do something productive or to be ethical or respectful of each other, you know, all the, the, those two different projects that we care about with this kind of activity? Um, I think a lot of times arguments that are guilty of fallacies. Uh, we can acknowledge the, those mistakes, but there's ways to fix them. There's ways to save them. Like I was saying earlier, even people like my students who give fallacious arguments, there's something sincere going on. They may have some kind of point and trying to recover that. How can you, when you're listening to someone else, use some charity and figure out like, okay, so maybe the way that they framed their point or the way that they argued for it it can't be accepted at face value. It's a bad argument because it violates some of these fallacies. But is what is the good part of it that could be, maybe they didn't have to word it that way. Maybe they could have made their point in a way that would have been more acceptable, that wouldn't have been guilty of one of these fallacies. Trying to find that um, and trying to help, you know, again, this is arguing as a cooperative activity, helping your conversational partner express their ideas and share their insights in a way that can be rationally acceptable, that isn't guilty of fallacies, is another part of our responsibilities, I think. I think we have responsibilities to help each other out with doing this whole project as effectively as possible. So in thinking about the fallacies and why you want to have these things on the radar, that's the framework that I encourage for all of you and for anybody for what meaning they should have. They are very helpful 
in recognizing what behavior we want to avoid and to recognize when something has gone wrong. But we also need to follow through on that criticism and figure out what to do after that happens, if it does happen. We want to avoid it if possible. That'd be great. It'd be great if everyone, every time they argued, never committed any fallacies. That would be awesome. But that's not going to happen. So we want to guard against it as much as possible, but when they do occur, what can we do about it? How can we save it? You can even do this, you don't have to just think about it as like your opponent making these kinds of mistakes. What happens when you recognize that the arguments that you are convinced by or that you would offer in that debate are guilty of some of these fallacies? How can you recover maybe some insight or a point that is legitimate? even amidst some expression of that idea that was not legitimate or problematic. Is this idea making sense, everyone in chat? you have any questions about what I'm throwing down here? Cool? Make sense? Okay, everyone's just saying, looking look good, I'm being clear, it's good to hear. <laughs> we don't have a lot of minutes left for today's class, so I'm hesitating on doing anything like adding, starting to get into a fallacy or something like that. Um, but the, these big picture ideas, I, I definitely want to make sure I got across in a, in a robust kind of way. I mean, the framing for what we do with this material is, is a lot. Here's one other idea maybe I can throw in from this morning. Remember I was talking about the fallacy fallacy. The idea that any argumentative mistakes or weaknesses to a position are going to come from the fallacies. This is kind of treating them as more important than they actually are. Um, they do contribute to our understanding of what would be better argumentative behavior and worse. Oh yeah, 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 I'll get to it. I'll get to it. Um, but they also... Uh, Oh, crap, I just lost my train of thought. Um, the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's important to recognize that um, you can have, so I've been describing a situation in which arguments that are fallacious can still have something of merit to them. But even arguments that are not guilty of any fallacies whatsoever can still be wrong or can still be weak. I mean, just because you've got an argumentative defense of your position that isn't guilty of one of these mistakes, it can still be maybe not the most rationally defensible position. Like, the, In other words, once we get all the legitimate arguments on the table, there's still room for disagreement and debate and accusations of, of mistake and reasoning that can happen that aren't captured by the fallacies. The fallacies are just a kind of a supplement to a lot of the other stuff we've been studying this quarter about inductive and deductive of standards for what makes for better arguments. I mean, you can have an argument from analogy that isn't guilty of any of the fallacies related to analogies, um, and yet is still weak compared to other analogies that can be drawn or other arguments that can be offered. Um, so the, the bottom line point here, Nathan, is that arguments that are free of fallacies, that are not making any of the fallacious mistakes, can still be objected to or shown to be weak or are maybe not providing sufficient defense to, to prove that the conclusion is the most rationally defensible issue. Even if we're on perfectly good behavior, there's still plenty of disagreement to be had and still plenty of work to be done on figuring out what makes the most sense. Okay, So the fallacies are not the end-all and be-all of good reasoning. Um, there's plenty of other stuff to debate, and that's why the history of philosophy, even professional philosophers are guilty of fallacies from time to time. Some of these are, are very hard to be on perfect behavior about, um, but there's plenty of work that happens in, in our disagreements that are not, we can't chalk up our disagreements on the grounds that just one side is using fallacies and the other is not or something. There's a lot more to good reasoning than just avoiding the fallacies, but the fallacies definitely contribute a lot to helping us with that. Does that make sense, that idea?
Yep, okay. Cool. And I gotta think of a code word here. Um, let's see. Hmm. Well, I'll just make it easy with what I've got around here. Poppy seed. Poppy seed's the code word. There we go. No. Poppy seed. So Nathan says, that's helpful. My brother will call me out in an argument saying I violated some fallacy so he won't address the argument I made because he thinks it's the end-all, be-all of the argument. Yeah, that would be, um, I mean, I don't know about particular situations of debate with you and your brother, but, you know, he could have a good point that he's thinking your argument is guilty of a fallacy and still be missing some other part of the point, right? Um, that there's some way maybe that you can fix your argument. You'll see some demonstrations of this when we get together again on Friday um, for our finals, our final session together. Uh, we, we will cover some particular fallacies then. Okay, I think that's it for today. But if you've got any questions, why don't you drop them in here? Maybe we can answer a few things here in the closing minutes. Um, it was it was poppy seed. Did you you didn't catch it earlier? Any other questions, comments, before we close up shop for today? Uh, yeah, so there's there's other things I've been prioritizing this weekend. So I've been, I kind of like let a couple days go and I go back and, and fix them up. So there are some, um, there are some attendance quizzes that are ungraded at the moment. I will be prioritizing exam two grading today before I get to that. <laughs> You're welcome. You too. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Good luck with everything. And let me know how I can help you this week. We're not going to see each other officially until Friday. There's a lot of time between then and now. Um, and if there's anything I can do to be supportive of you in finishing up everything for our class and just for the quarter in general, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. All right. See everyone. <laughs>